and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tianwei in Beijing. Global financial policymakers convened this week for the springtime meetings of the IMF and the World Bank. Ahead of the meetings, the IMF chief urged governments to invest in greener and smarter economies for a post-COVID recovery. A green investment push can lift up growth by 0.7% over the next uh, 15 years and create millions of green jobs. With the world moving toward a net zero future, green finance is poised to be a long-term sustainable solution to climate change. According to the World Bank, it has so far issued over 160 green bonds in 22 currencies, nearly $15 billion to finance climate resilient growth. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, also known as AIIB, also set a target of ensuring 50% of its overall financing by 2025 will be for green finance. So what actions can we expect from China? What will it take to shape a resilient recovery that works for the people and the planet? And how will China work with the others toward those goals? Let's loop in our panelists. For more on the green finance and climate change in New York, we are joined by Jeffrey Sachs, professor and director of the Center for Sustainable Development from Columbia University. In London, we are joined by Isabel Hilton, CEO and editor of ChinaDialogue.net. And in London, Bob Ward, policy and communications director with uh, Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and Environment from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Last but not least in Guangzhou, Chi Ye, Professor of Public Policy for Tsinghua University and Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. This is such a strong panel. Hello to everyone. Thank you for joining us. I want you. to start by asking Professor Sachs, uh, this time this week, uh, during the uh, annual session of the World Bank and the IMF, uh, the issue of climate change is certainly to be well discussed. How do you think the financial world and the development issues could contribute to the overall discussion. We're definitely uh, past the tipping point now. There's a lot of momentum for uh, a major energy transformation worldwide. All of the major economies are signing up to the idea of decarbonization by mid-century. Uh, China has announced uh, decarbonization by no later than 2060. Uh, Japan and Korea by 2050. The European Union by 2050. The UK by 2050. President Biden by 2050. This is a, a big change. And uh, investors have lost a lot of money investing in fossil fuels uh, during the past decade. They finally woke up to reality. It took them a lot of time. Mm -hmm. But I think there is a significant change underway. And I'm sure that at the IMF World Bank meetings, there will be talk about uh, what is also needed, much more public financing for the energy transformation. Right. Now, Professor Chi, if you think about the World Bank and the IMF, uh, the money that they have in their hands for development issues uh, could be quite limited. Uh, the, meanwhile, there is a lot of debate about the debt issue, debt trap among the developing countries. Uh, some say it's not necessarily the real issue, uh, but rather a man-made issue. Uh, Professor Chi, how much do you think you know, the World Bank and the IMF uh, meetings uh, this time and the discussion related to it could really contribute to the real discussion of climate change and measures uh, uh, related to it? You know, ever since late last year, I think the world now is developing uh, a new consensus, like Professor Sachs just mentioned. All major economies now have uh, either announced or about to announce their goal for carbon neutrality. Right. And the world now, depending on how you count it, 80 to 120 countries now either planning or have already developed their goal for carbon neutrality. Mm -hmm. I think this is a major consensus with IMF and the World Bank joining force and to, uh, to, to indicate a major shift of financing of uh, financial resources into this endeavor for carbon neutrality. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a very, very big signal that the business world 
should should receive. In fact, you know the the finance world that they are operating on this uh, something called shared belief, right? The uh, when the 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 whole society now develop a shared belief, then the money and the other resources it will pour in. I think that this I hope this this represent a major okay. shift. There are very different standards about green finance and very different ways of understanding it worldwide. The Go financial ahead. system is moving very quickly away from funding for uh, unsustainable investments uh, and then particularly fossil fuels. Coal these days uh, is a rather foolish investment, uh, likely that you will lose your money if you invest in fossil fuels. But there is a lot of discussion about what are the ro appropriate standards or taxonomies that you should uh, use in order to judge the quality of the investment. Now, mm. I, I think it's going to take a bit of time to sort this all out, but I think it's fairly clear that you shouldn't be investing in fossil fuels. You want to be investing in things that have a future. Mm. That's renewable energy, that's electric vehicles. It's all the things that we can see are being developed. And I, mm. I think that this discussion about the standards is really just part of a that transition mm -hmm. that is happening very, very quickly, both on the private side and on the public finance mm. side. The U.S. now committed to the Paris Accord, but uh, with the politics change going on in the U.S. from the federal level, there could be policy switch again four years from now. Secondly, uh, there is also a lot of different understanding about what it means at a national level in terms of uh, uh, carbon zero and carbon neutrality, uh, particularly when you have the developing countries that are in a very different stage of development compared to the developed economies. So how do you understand uh, you know, all of these uh, uh, complex issues? Well, we do have a fairly complicated picture if you, if you take a global view. As far as the US going back again into an anti-climate position, I think in four years' time that will look a lot less likely, partly because of the shifts that we've been hearing about, that it just makes much less sense. You know, the market is killing coal. It makes much less sense to invest in fossil fuels than it did even five years ago. Money will go where the profit is, and increasingly that is in renewables. So we see this accelerating push into renewables, and every report that's come out in the last six months has emphasized this, including the IEA's report. So I think that just the, the market forces will be very much against the kind of switch that we saw um, under Donald Trump. And even if the, that were to happen at a federal level, at a state and city level in the United States, I think we'd still see momentum growing uh, again because it makes sense. Yeah. As far as emerging economies go, I mean, the biggest emerging economy that hasn't declared yet a, a carbon neutrality target is India. There is some expectation that it might. But even if it doesn't, um, again, you, if you look at the pattern of investment in India, which was expected to build a lot of new coal, that has fallen away dramatically. And India is now expected to cut its coal investments by, some, by uh, around 84 percent, mm -hmm. which, is, which is big. And, and there will be a, a corresponding ramp up of, of uh, solar, it, which is, which is you know, the big bet that India is making. Right. So that even in, in emerging economies, and you see actually quite a lot of smaller economies are doing rather better um, in terms of carbon neutrality than the big ones. Um, you know, Uruguay, Costa Rica, there are any number of, of really positive examples out there. Okay. So I think the momentum is with it. Professor Sachs, do you see much chance that China and U.S. could really cooperate on climate change? Well, there, there is a common interest. Uh, the two largest emitters uh, in the world uh, with combined emissions of more than 40 percent of the total greenhouse gases, we have a lot of work to do. I think uh, analyzing uh, the ways forward together, uh, proposing expanded models for multilateral development bank financing mm -hmm. of the transition around the world, uh, helping to recapitalize uh, these banks uh, with uh, more lending power. These are very practical areas where the U.S. and China should be working together. And I know that that is the, uh, the intention uh, of uh, the U.S., even though the rhetoric has been uh, not to my liking uh, in recent weeks. I think there is a lot of scope for cooperation. And I hope in the next few weeks with 
the IMF World Bank meetings, uh, with the meeting that the President Biden has called, mm -hmm. uh, and so forth, that that opportunity for cooperation will come to the forefront. There's just been too much uh, negative and too much bickering, and uh, we really need the cooperation. Right. Professor Xi, we heard a lot from the uh, Special Envoy on Climate Change, uh, uh, Mr. Kerry, talking about cooperation with China. And yet we heard from the foreign policy decision makers inside the U.S., for example, from the Secretary of State uh, and from the National Security Advisor, mainly it's more words about competition and even rivalry. So there seems to be a very different uh, uh, pages that uh, different leaders in the administration are on. I think that common goal, this uh, that's, uh, that's carbon neutrality one, is a major one, right? The uh, President Biden made it quite clear, 2050, this is uh, this some way matches uh, the our 2060 carbon neutrality. And to, in order to achieve this common goal of carbon neutrality, there are, are many other things to do. The uh, Right now, it is much harder than a couple of years ago when we talk about cooperation on technology and financing, but still, there are opportunities. Financing in particular, right? This is, a, this is one area that China has announced to put in a lot of money, and the U.S. $2.3 trillion to for infrastructure with a major share of that into green financing to mm -hmm. finance the, the green growth. Technology is certainly one area we, we should work together, but, uh, but it's, it's pretty hard right now. We see different timetable about the carbon zero and carbon neutrality. However, there were, um, there were people that were trying to push the developing country also to claim 2050 as the carbon a neutrality time. If um, politicians set out a target, it gives a clear signal to the private sector yeah. about the pace and the direction. And so these are important. China has a tremendous challenge on its uh, hands now that if it wants to go from peaking in, say, 2030 to carbon neutrality in 2060, that's a period of only 30 years. That's going to be a real challenge. Many other countries around the world uh, peaked uh, a long time ago, particularly in Europe. Uh, the UK peaked its emissions in the 1970s. So it would make sense for, for China to accelerate. But I think what will drive this more than anything else is an understanding that the best way of ensuring sustainable growth over the long term is by investing in all the technologies and the business mo models and methods that actually move you away from a reliance on fossil fuels. And I think that understanding now that you can develop and grow in a much cleaner and smarter way mm. and that it's good for your economy will drive that transition right. much more quickly than even the target. We've been hearing this for a long time. Every country also have their own circumstances. So as you said, uh, the European countries, some of them already peaked during the 1970s and 80s, and therefore the next target will be much easier. But uh, Ms. Hilton, you've been doing research about China and some Asian countries. Uh, 2060, China already have to put enormous amount of efforts in order to achieve. Uh, yes, that's true. In all of these long distance, long term targets, the sooner you start, the 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 less steep the slope you have to climb. And and the concern about China's target, and in particular in the light of the 14 five year plan, which we've just um, seen published, is that leaving it, uh, leaving the major effort till after 2030 is going to make it much harder after 2030. Um, you know, every country is different. Um, and and in, you know, going back to your question of how China and the United States could cooperate, for example, um, one would be to have a common framework for assistance to emerging economies, to developing economies, to help them avoid going down a carbon-heavy pathway, which has been the traditional pathway, the fast, the fast route of development, mm. which we can no longer afford. Help them skip that, uh, that stage and go straight to uh, an energy system for the 21st century, mm -hmm. for example. Agreeing common development policies and common standards there would make an enormous difference, both to those emerging economies and to global emissions. So there are lots of ways now that, that for example, since China has made renewables effectively cheaper, 
than fossil fuels in many geographies. That opens up lots of opportunities for collaboration mm. if we could just have the imagination to seize them. I think it's going to go faster than we think uh, because uh, essentially the technologies have gotten a lot better. Uh, China has uh, also made a huge advance. Uh, storage has come down uh, uh, in costs, so the intermittency of renewable energy is mm. uh, not such a problem as it was perceived to be before. The, the fact of the matter is we have to uh, watch not only what we think are our own economic timetables, but nature's timetable as well. We're in a very dangerous situation globally. We're close to uh, tipping points of nature uh, in terms of uh, massive rise of sea levels uh, because of the destruction of the ice sheets, uh, the change in yeah. the ocean circulation. And that's why 2050 is really uh, a late date. I believe that China will decarbonize well before 2060 because China does everything very fast and very effectively. And I think 2050 will prove to be an absolutely manageable target. <laughs> you are Professor Sachs and much more confident about that goal that you set uh, than uh, most of the Chinese policymakers who are looking at the numbers uh, right now as we speak. Professor you know, Chi I'm, I'm a big believer in China's capacity, so I think that China will move very fast in this. Well, encouragement is certainly needed, but also uh, looking into reality is also needed. Let me go to Professor Chi also for that, that question. I share the optimism of uh, Professor Sachs <laughs> about the future, future trend. I, I just want to clarify the 2060 versus 2050 target most, most, most developed countries have identified. We, have to, we need to put it in a context. You know, the United Nations Environmental Program regularly publish uh, the so-called gap analysis report. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this gap analysis is based on some assumptions the equity and the capacity and so on and so forth. If you put this uh, 2060 target China has announced into that context, you realize this is a trajectory for the, the uh, uh, consistent to the IPCC 1.5 degrees Celsius. So th this is a really ambitious based on the UN environment uh, uh, analysis uh, analytical framework. Mm -hmm. So this is a uh, this, this is very very significant. Just like Mr. Word just uh, uh, mentioned, you know, from peak to neutrality, and EU takes uh, 60 years, US 45 years, UK 80 years, and China has to get this down by 30 years. This means tremendous tremendous uh, effort and, and challenges. You're talking about the jobs and the people who are now in the sector, fossil fuel sector, there are many of them, three million, three, three million people in the coal fired power plant, for instance, not a lot of people you need, we need to think about. And there, there are a lot of the investment that will necessarily become stranded asset. There's one elephant in the room that we haven't talked about. That is how much trust there really is there in our world when the geopolitics has become such a big a phenomenon. Uh, whether we're going to see that also uh, poisoning the atmosphere of cooperation for climate change, we do not know. How much confidence do you have, Professor Sachs? I feel a lot better now than I did uh, before the November uh, 2020 election. Uh, we had a very uh, uh, nutty president, a uh, very dangerous person. Uh, I think we got beyond that. Uh, and uh, I think the chance for rational cooperation among all the major economies is vastly, vastly greater now. Professor, I'm, if I could I'm, just I'm, uh, interrupt uh, here, because it's, uh, it has to be said, you know, since the new administration coming into power, many of the things that the earlier administration did, for example, sanctions and things like that, have not moved away. What about the, the strategic relationship between China and the United States? Whether that's improved or not, will that help with the climate change or cooperation, if there were any? What gives me confidence is that uh, this uh, new administration in the U.S. is uh, far more rational. It is rational. Uh, it is uh, forward-looking. Uh, it is uh, in the right direction on this issue, 
So if you ask me, uh, of course, uh, I, I read the uh, same headlines, hear the same <laughs> speeches and so on, but, but I am uh, more optimistic. Mm. Uh, I'm very encouraged by seeing John Kerry and Xie Jinhua back in harness because yeah. this is you know, a very positive personal relationship. It is going to take all of that chemistry to keep things on track, however, because as you say, there are serious risks here in the geopolitical um, configuration. And I think we've already seen that in terms of a certain caution in energy security, which mm. we've seen in, again in the 14 to five year plan. Security was very much a dominant theme. Mm -hmm. and, and you know the idea that we're still building coal because that provides security it, in one sense, it, but it's in, it's antithetical to climate security in another. So we can already see these tensions. I think that lines of communication are going to be very important as we as we go forward. Because, yeah. for example, the European Union, which has the largest and most progressive climate strategy, is talking about carbon border tax adjustments. So that is, you know, how do you protect your own industries as you make this transition? from carbon leakage and there will be uh, a, a, by the end of the year I'm pretty sure a system uh, going into place in Europe of, of tariffs sure. against high carbon goods. Now in order to manage that without more disharmony we are going to have to keep these lines of communication going and see if we can act in concert with each other on common standards so that we reinforce mm -hmm. cooperation instead of blowing it up. If there's one thing we should have learned from the pandemic is that our futures are all interconnected and that the only way forward is through cooperation. Uh, you cannot have a world in which there is prosperity and well-being for everyone by trying to c close yourself off. There has to be this cooperation in order for us all to make progress. Yeah. And I think that climate change infectious disease and biodiversity loss are huge global challenges mm -hmm. and we all have to work together and I would hope that the governments of the United States, of China, of Europe, of all governments understand that we have to work together to tackle these yeah. because as the pandemic has shown, if one country is not safe, then we're all exposed to the same risk. Absolutely. We all have to work together. We have to realize and pray that geopolitics and climate change are working in very different scale and scope. All right, the uh, climate change will be with us for a long time, and cooperation is a must for yeah. all, of, all of us. I think we have developed a consensus right now. We should capitalize on our consensus. And uh, just, you know, to, for many other issues, including including this border adjustment tax that uh, Isabel just mentioned. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're not controversial, they're not helping, right? Let's just, uh, let's just capitalize on our car carbon neutrality consensus and build up on that and, uh, and develop a, a common goal and common program. I think we really need to borrow some, the sense of optimism, the sense of consensus, camaraderie, and the sense of, uh, you know, common sense. Uh, from this conversation, from every one of the four of you. Thank you so much for your contribution. Jeffrey Sachs, Isabel Hilton, Bob Ward, last but not least, Chi Ye. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome back. You're watching World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. China and the EU market has been advancing in recent years, with China becoming the largest trading partner of the European Union. The two sides have signed a comprehensive agreement on investment, or CAI, a wide-ranging deal to boost economic cooperation. But the recent decision made by the EU to impose sanctions on the Chinese officials over the Xinjiang issue has cast its shadow on bilateral trade. Earlier, I spoke to Jörg Whitaker, president of the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China. He said despite lingering uncertainties, China is still an important market that few companies would walk away from. Let's take a listen. Global supply chains are going to change. Some argue much, some argue not much at all. What do you see uh, from your business and also those of the European businesses that you're representing? Well, supply chain, uh, chain was talked about in the beginning of last year, you know, COVID and interruptions and so forth. 
But our members are absolutely in China for China. The surveys always indicate a lower single digit figure of companies considering to move out. So when it comes to this kind of competitiveness of China, there is no question, and the growth model is anyhow pointing towards China. But now it gets very tricky on the PR side. Mm. Uh, that's something where companies all of a sudden have to do some soul searching how to deal with this in China as well as the rest of the world. There are so many things that's going on as we speak. The sanctions toward one another, what does that mean for the European businesses? Well, they put us between a rock and a hard place. And so it's very hard for us to either follow the mood on our headquarters and back home or basically try to safeguard our entry into the Chinese market. No, for ter terrible for business, terrible. Mm. So that means you will have a probably a ever more challenging time trying to make sure the business operations of the European countries in China sound and also on track. What are some of the biggest challenges for you right now? Well, the biggest challenge definitely is uh, to keep in touch with the home base, the constituency back home. And yeah. ours is very, very diversified. I mean, we have uh, company headquarters, we have governments, we have NGOs, we have parliaments. I mean, it's a hell of a and lot of stakeholders. Yeah. And public opinion has not been really moving in the favorable direction of China. And here, of course, I have equally a severe public opinion. So for me, it's really very hard to navigate something and still trying to be credible towards both stakeholders. What about the rest of the world? When you are looking at the European businesses, it's not just to look at the China market, but also the international market from China. How, what about that part? Well, for, take major textile companies yeah. uh, that it's have... It's different one sector from another, isn't it? Definitely. 10-20% uh, of their sales is in China. Uh, 80 to 90 percent is outside China. So even China is the growth, uh, fastest growing market here. At the same time, these uh, companies have a lot to lose. And it's also interesting, actually, most of these companies that have been mentioned over the last two or three weeks, they actually have no assets in China. They have nothing. They rent buildings, they hire people, and they produce here. So the whole sourcing model has to be reconsidered. Do I produce in China for China and outside China for the rest of the world? How do I do this? How? I wonder. I mean, there must be smarter people like myself. I'm a, working for a company that has assets on the ground. Uh, we really put steel and concrete there big time. Mm -hmm. So for us, there's no question of leaving. But for companies that basically own a warehouse uh, here, that might be a very easy thing. Well, I think that we have reached the level where uh, you possibly have to lean towards the side that gives you the least pain. So it's, it's going to be very difficult. Business hates to be politicized. Right. There are several things that we probably need to put into this discussion. First of all, about political system and different understandings of human rights. Secondly, geopolitics, probably related to the interpretation of human rights all of a sudden. And thirdly, we also need to see how the world's economy has been changing as a result of the market. So all of these put together, we have never seen that before, not even during the Cold War, it seems. Business has to look into growth models. That we owe this to our employees. We owe this to our shareholders. China stands for 30, 35% of global growth in the next 10 years, and chemicals, 60%. So, I mean, you can't really disengage here. At the same time, again, we are liable to uh, legislation and capital markets back home. Right. Uh, and that, that might lead to the fact that you have to make up your mind, do I stick with 5%, 10% of the market mm -hmm. or not? And at the same time, for Chinese companies, it's equally challenging because if they make a very public statement only source from Xinjiang, they might cut themselves off from global markets. So it bites both ways. We used to believe that it's the tr global trade that brings all of us together, and the bond is going to be ever stronger. Are we seeing just a hiccup of this, or this is likely to be the very nature of a prolonged process? Your judgment. I, I'm thinking about this a lot, I must say, and, and I must say I have no because answer have for it. I, well, we have to deal with our stakeholders. Um, I guess this is going to go on for a long, long time. Are voices of the businesses being heard, really? I think uh, decreasingly so, honestly. We, we Why as, is that? I think that um, uh, business has taken a hit in the great financial crisis. Don't overestimate the influence of multinationals. It's not as big as people think it is. Mm. Uh, and what about the small and medium-sized enterprises? I understand they are also a member of yours. 
Well, we have 1,700 members in, in nine cities, and of course, uh, they have the same uh, challenges that we face. Talking about uh, China and Europe, uh, the earlier agreement on the investment has been winning a lot of applause from both sides. I know you and your colleague here at the chamber has been working very hard for it. You argued for the right way out every twist and turn. Now, where are we? Well, so we had seven years of negotiations uh, and we had to defend it towards uh, voices from the U.S. This is wait for Europeans and so forth. And we were really happy it came to a fruitful conclusion in December. Uh, courtesy to Angela Merkel and the Chinese president, they both really carried it over the finishing line. It's a reasonable, it's a good agreement. And now, of course, because of the sanctions, uh, the European Parliament, at least the big parties, made it very clear, unless the Chinese are lifting the sanctions on European parliamentarians, the European Parliament will not even look at it. So how to get out of this? And I, I can't see an easy exit ramp for both parties to actually go to the next level of cooperation. Mm. To the Chinese, it's easy to understand the alliance relationship between many of the European countries and the United States. After all, it's been there for decades. However, it is equally difficult for the Chinese to understand how Europeans, particularly the politics, would not appreciate the rise of China and also the potential of partnership China and Europe together will be able to create. Why this is so difficult? Well, I mean, 40 years ago, I showed, uh, I told my mother that I'm going to study Chinese, and she, she dropped nearly mad. She thought I lost my mind. And then uh, 20 years after, it became the growth story. Globalization was basically how to include China. So in a way, I, I must say that we have moved through a long period of time and engagement with China. China had an incredibly good uh, standing. It was looked at very favorable in Europe for a long time. That actually has also a lot to do with that virtually every village has a Chinese restaurant. So China was always well perceived. Now, of course, if you have a very strong growing economy uh, with a strong assertive policy voice, then it looks, of course, very different. And uh, I think the crisis of the last years where Europeans were facing Brexit, where Europeans facing Donald Trump, where Europeans facing uh, uh, the great financial crisis, has also lowered our self-esteem, I guess, to some extent. And if you lower self-esteem, of course, you view others as a challenge. So my thing is not we cannot contain China. We should not try to even contain China. We have to fix ourselves first and foremost. China also has to uh, accommodate. They're a huge state, huge civilization. So in a way, I think first and foremost, Europe has to grow on the challenge of China and not trying to fight it back. To some of the Chinese, um, it seems that the Europeans are fighting a bi battle not for themselves, but for the Biden administration. I would say uh, just the agreement you mentioned in December, it was approved by 27 member states as well as the Commission on the basis that the Americans told them, don't do it or wait for us. Mm -hmm. That should have sent a message to Beijing. It's like, we can do our own stuff. We don't depend on Washington. Mm -hmm. They have to take Europe as it is alone. Yes, we are allies with the Americans, but we are not a poodle. Mm -hmm. Chinese President Xi Jinping during the two sessions, York, said that now China can really look at the others in the eyes as equals. So how do you understand this overall picture behind everything we discussed today? Um, I guess it really uh, is very important to see uh, that also China has to realize there is no level playing field. China is much bigger. Uh, they have a much bigger economy. They, have a, they are social, they are United Nations Security Council member. They are 1.4 billion people. I think that China actually does realize how big it is and how dominant it is in many ways. With this firepower, economic, uh, people, innovation as well, uh, China should not actually believe that uh, people look down on it. It's absolutely uh, not related to history, I would say. So we are seeing something that we didn't see earlier, and therefore, that's the argument. The previous uh, so-called historical lessons should be learned, but to what extent, under what framework? Well, if you look at Southeast Asia, if you look at Europe, we don't, we don't want to choose between 
China or the US and other places. But if, if the message is like, you know, there's always the US behind decision making, then of course you actually make that happen. What about next, uh, York? For example, about technology, about innovation, even now about raw materials. Um, everything could be termed as national security in the U.S. in this relation with China particularly. Now, are we going to see that danger also with the Europeans? After all, 40% of all high tech that enters China is coming from the European Union. We still have these particular SMEs, what we call the hidden champions. Now, we are very good at this and we intend to remain as good at this. And again, that's come back to my point, we have to do our homework. We cannot lament that China's rising. We benefit from China's rise. And of course, we are competitors in third markets. But again, if you're a competitor, the thing you have to do is to fix yourself. So in a way, I guess that uh, uh, I, like, I like to see China actually being more innovative, be more open. We rely in many ways on better Chinese innovation. Um, and, and we're still waiting for it. In many ways, China has great business models, but not great products. Mm -hmm. uh, it would benefit us all if China comes up with this kind of innovation. You've been working very hard with your colleague in China and many business leaders uh, to make sure that business voice will be heard so that there will be better and more balanced decisions being made by politicians. What do you think that we most need in terms of the quality of leadership, not just about business, but also about you know, our world in a very critical transition? It's very difficult in the times of social media and internet to have a balanced, wise decision making. Something where I feel like the internet became an anger accelerator, really making it politically very difficult to change your mind. Um, so I, frankly, it's very depressing actually to see that the avenue in order to have a better understanding is very, very small. Uh, I guess still we should not give up and actually should make an effort in order to show with more transparency and accountability what the other party is all about. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it is, it is going to be a challenge, but you know, um, uh, it is also something where you can grow uh, with, I think, if you stand up for understanding and peace. Finally, before we go, you've been in China for a very long time. How many years? I lived here more than 30 years and I came here 40 years ago, first time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a fossil. <laughs> so, almost the very beginning of China's reform and opening up, you were there already. And you went through, together with China, some of the ups and downs during mm -hmm. the process. What is your takeaway of the current situation? I had the privilege of witnessing the largest economic comeback story in the world uh, firsthand. And, uh, and you contributed to that. I, I was a small, small piece of that uh, miracle in a way. Um, at the same time, I must say that uh, uh, there is a stronger China. It's a more diverse, open-minded China in some areas. At the same time, um, I feel like there's less uh, acceptance, understanding from people outside. Again, uh, most countries, 199, are smaller than China. Mm -hmm. And I think China has to realize that actually uh, these countries can contribute as well. Uh, so in a way, I, my, my um, anticipation that China will grow and will basically become a good responsible stakeholder never fades away. Mm -hmm. Jörg Wetka, as always, a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Jörg Wedeka, chairman of the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, search World Inside or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for watching and bye for now.